All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get into um, what it is we're looking at this morning. By the way, I forgot to mention, um, we had planned to go to Colorado Springs uh, this past week and um, got all the way to the airport and um, packed, made all the preparations and we're there. And then we find out that our flight, well, first of all, it's being pushed forward. And then finally, it's canceled. So um, actually ended up working this past week. That's why I'm... Uh, uh, preaching a sermon this morning. The plan was to have, um, you know, have me lead the service and we we're going to do everything that we normally would but have a video instead of me as, as pulpit supply. And that would have been Steve Lawson speaking on this very text. Now, I'm not going to use the things that he said, but I thought it was good text, so I thought I would go ahead and use it. But um, <clears throat> we're going to let him um, expound, um, again, what Edwards has to say this evening uh, from Edwards. And again, it's not He's not going to be dealing with, and we shouldn't look at it this way, Edwards says we should do this, therefore we should do this. That, that's not what it is. But Edwards looks at the Word of God, and he sees this is what our Lord calls us to do. This is how we might best prepare for the day of our death. How are we going to have a comfortable death? Um, it's only if we live the kind of life that's honoring to the Lord. And so that is what he purposed to do. And he's going to give us several things that he sees from Scripture in order to do that. But what I'm going to do this morning is a little bit different. I'm going to focus on the command to use the time well. And I want us to see some motives, some things that will help us to be able to do this. Not so much directions, um, but rather, again, the command. We, we need to see this is what our Lord calls us to. And things that will encourage us to do this and strengthen us in the use of our time. All right. So let's begin by uh, looking at the passage. Um, John, John's Gospel, chapter 9. And I'd like to read verses 1 through 5. The principle comes from verse 4. Uh, but I am going to set that verse in its context because I think there's things we can learn from the context as well. <clears throat> so John chapter 1, or excuse me, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he would be born blind. Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now, I think we understand that um, time is important. It's important to each one of us. It's important to us as a society. I mean, we can see this from all the different things, that devices that we have made in order to keep track of it. You know, we have watches on our wrists. We have clocks on the walls. We have timers in our kitchens, uh, alarm clocks in our bedrooms. And not to mention the calendars and the planners that we have in order to track our daily, monthly, yearly plans. We want to make sure that we're where we need to be on time and that we get done what we need to get done in, in a given time frame so that we don't run out of time before we finish our work. Now, today, as I've already mentioned, is an important time marker isn't it? It's one of the most sobering and encouraging dates at the same time, really, on our calendars, you know, New Year's Day. It's the first day of the first month of, of a brand new year. And it's, it's sobering because it means that this last year has come to an end. And so, to speak, there are fewer ahead of us in which to finish our work. It's a time for us to reflect on whether or not we've used that time well. Now, I'm not going to focus on that so much, except on how we should use our time. And as we focus on how we use it, that should help us reflect on how we should view how we've used the time we've, we've just spent. So that's how New Year's Day is sobering. But it's also encouraging. Okay? 
not only because we're one year closer to being with the Lord than we were at this time last year, right? There's fewer days ahead of us, and as the Apostle Paul says, to depart and to be with Christ is very much better than being in this world. But it's also encouraging because having a new year ahead of us, we also have new opportunities in which to serve the Lord, in which to glorify Him, in which to do His work. Now today, we're going to look at what God wants us to do with our time. And in a word, it is to glorify Him by doing what it is He made us to do, what He redeemed us to do. Remember, we've been going through the book of Romans, and Paul reminded us in Romans 12:1 that we, on a daily basis, are to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Remember that worship is not just what we do on the Lord's Day as we gather together, but all of life is to be worshipped. This takes all of our time because we are to worship Him in everything. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10.31, again, that very familiar verse, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We are to be using our time to give glory to the Lord in absolutely everything. So God's work, God's service, our worship, our giving glory to Him is not a part-time work. It's not a Sunday-only kind of thing when we meet together. But it's, it's the way we are to live. It's the way that Jesus lived. Now, this evening, Steve Lawson is going to encourage us, as I've said, to use our time well by living with an eternal perspective. Always think about where we're headed and how what we're doing now is going to affect then because it has a huge impact on that. And as I've said, he's going to draw from Jonathan Edwards' resolutions as a guide. This morning, we're going to look at Jesus' command to use our time in this way as well as some encouragements to the sin. So first of all, let's consider Jesus' command to use our time for God. Now Jesus tells us, or John tells us, that as Jesus was traveling with the disciples, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. And we know that this was no coincidence. We know that on, you know, in God's calendar and God's plan and Uh, There were no coincidences in Jesus' life. There were only divine appointments. And we also knew that Jesus kept all of those appointments, and he used them all for God's glory. And that's what we see here. When the disciples asked him why the man was blind, whether it was the result of his sin or that of his parents, and, you know, they were thinking that this might have been some form of divine punishment and Certainly that, that does happen, and that's something that they were more aware of in those days as they lived their lives before the Lord, the Jews did, at least they thought they were doing so. Jesus said, no, it wasn't either of those things, but something that God had allowed for His glory, an appointment that He had prepared or many years in, in the making so that Jesus could come and heal Him. Now, whenever I read this passage, maybe you've had the same you know, response. You think about the fact that this man was blind from his infancy to his adulthood just so that Jesus could come and do this miracle. We might think that that was perhaps cruel on, on the part of God to allow this man to be blind for so many years. But I just wanted to offer to us the right way of looking at this passage because sometimes we just take a lot of things for granted. First of all, we need to remember that God has the right to do with His creatures, with us, whatever He wills. Isn't that true? I mean, He made us, we belong to Him. And do you remember what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar as he was boasting about his might and his power and his glory and how he built Babylon and so forth and how the Lord judged him and made him basically crazy for seven seasons? We don't know exactly how long those seasons were, but they were long enough. And how at the end of that time, King Nebuchadnezzar realized when the Lord restored his reason after humbling him in this way, he said this, all the inhabitants of the earth are recounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? 
You see, God can do whatever he wants to do. That, that is his prerogative because he is the creator. Okay, but secondly, that all of our abilities, as well as our senses, we have five of them, they're all gifts from God, aren't they? Gifts that God has loaned us for, to use for his glory. So being gifts and things that we really don't deserve, how can we complain if God decides he's going to withhold one or more of them? I mean, we don't deserve them. They're, they're purely of his grace. You know, Bob Needham uh, often reminded us when we were in counseling uh, as, as a session and so forth, he was kind of as a biblical counselor coaching the rest of the session members. Bob Needham is one of our um, ministers who's augmenting our session for those who, who don't know who he is. When he was in counseling and people are having maybe marital issues and perhaps the wife or perhaps the husband uh, will get frustrated and, and say, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve what I'm going through. Uh, Bob Needham will always ask that person, oh, what is it that you think you do deserve? And you know what the answer to that question is? I mean, what is it that each of us actually deserves? The answer is hell, okay? That's what we deserve. Remember, the salvation that we get through the Lord Jesus Christ is not something we earn. It's something that Jesus earned for us. We deserve hell. God justifies the ungodly, the ungodly who deserve hell. That's what we deserve for our sins. If we're not there... As Bob Needham would remind that person, if you're not in hell right now, God is being very gracious to you. He's, not, he's, he's given you things that, that you don't deserve, but they're good things that you don't deserve. So whatever our condition may be, if we're not in hell, then we are receiving grace, God's mercy and his grace. We, we do need to understand that. And, and understand this as well, that the Lord may have withheld one gift from this man, but he didn't withhold all of his gifts, did he? The man was still enjoying God's mercy, uh, not his judgment, and he was being taken care of from day to day. The Lord was sustaining him and providing for him. Yes, life was difficult, but he was alive. So he was actually blessed. But thirdly, let's look at what God gave him through the Lord Jesus Christ. He not only blessed him with the sight of that he had long withheld and he never actually had possessed before, but he gave him something infinitely more precious. He gave him the faith that saves. He trusted in Christ and he was gloriously saved, justified by the righteousness of Christ. He had a title for heaven, something he didn't deserve, something none of us deserve. And that's why he was ultimately put out of the synagogue, remember, is because he now loved and trusted Jesus, this one who had given him physical sight. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus, in doing this miracle, did not do this merely to draw attention to his Father's mercy and grace toward this man, though that was the main reason he did it. He also did this as an object lesson for his disciples. He wanted to teach them something. So after he heals him, turning to them, he says in verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Now, why is Jesus using the imagery of night and day? Well, it seems that he's drawing that from what he just did with regard to this blind man, from being, bringing him from darkness to light. Okay, when the man was blind and in darkness, there was nothing he could do. But now that he had light, now that he could see, work was possible for him. And that was true not only physically, but it was also true spiritually. You know, in his spiritual condition, in, his, in the darkness of sin, he could do no spiritual good. But now that he was alive, now that he was in the light, he could do this. Jesus is telling his disciples that as God has given to them both physical sight, physical life, and spiritual sight, as well as the time to use it, the daytime of their lives, that they were to use it to glorify God. Now notice that, that Jesus applies this to himself, doesn't he? He says while it is day, while he's in the world, while there is still time, 
He must work the works of him who sent him. He must show his people the Father's glory. That's the reason why he came into the world. He must preach the gospel. He must gather the lost sheep from the house of Israel. Because night was coming, his time on earth was going to come to an end when he would no longer be able to do this. So Jesus said, I need to use my daytime, the time of my life, to complete the work that, that the Father has given me to do. But notice that he also applies this to his disciples. He says, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is today. Jesus also gave to his disciples his word and his spirit so that they could carry on this work. And let's not forget, that's the reason why he also gave us his word and his spirit so that we could do the same. Now, that's the command, okay? That is what our Lord calls us to do. Let's use our remaining time to just look at a few things that will encourage us to do this, and we'll look to this evening for more direction on, on how to do this. Now, we've already seen that this is what Jesus commands us to do. And if the Lord of our hearts calls us to give our lives to Him, that should be motivation enough, right? Because really, by the Holy Spirit, we love God. We love Christ. We love them with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but never as we should. But we do love them most of all. And if the one we love most of all says, this is how I want you to serve me, this is how I want you to glorify me, that should be enough. But we should consider some of the things. Why does our Lord call us to do this? Well, this is how he's going to reach other, the other sheep that he's going to save. This is how he's going to find his lost sheep. This is how his Father is going to be glorified. This is how Jesus is going to receive his reward. And this is how we are going to store up treasures in heaven. Now, we know that our Lord has sheep that are yet to be gathered. There are people who are yet to be saved to trust in Jesus. If that wasn't the case, the Bible says that Jesus would already have come because his purpose for this world would, would be over. But we are the means that he uses to gather these sheep together through our personal witness and our evangelism and, and our prayers. Okay? And think about what a privilege it is to be called to do this very important work, to be the ones that stand in the place of Christ and, and appeal to lost sinners to, to come to Christ that they might be saved. And how much more a privilege it is when the Lord actually uses us to bring one of his own home. You know, I, I think one of the greatest times when you sense subjectively the, the pleasure of the Lord, you, you sense his pleasure and his love is when you're sharing the gospel with someone. I, I, I don't think there is probably anything we can do greater than that except to see that person actually come to Christ. The Bible tells us that when one lost sinner trusts in Christ, that heaven rejoices. As Jesus said, as the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes and looks for the lost sheep, he rejoices more over that one lost one than over the 99 who didn't need repentance. That's how much he rejoices. And we can, we can be a part of that. Because this salvation gives glory to God. It glorifies Him for His grace. And, of course, it makes an addition to Christ's reward, to His, his flock, His sheep, His bride, His body. And, of course, when we give our lives and our time to the Lord, not only will our reward in heaven be greater. Remember how Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, don't lay up treasures for yourself on earth because you can, you're going to lose all that. But lay up your treasures in heaven. How do you do that? Well, by giving your time to the Lord to serve Him in this way. When we serve Him in this way, not only will our reward in heaven be greater, but as I've said, we're also going to experience greater blessing on earth, more of His love and joy in our hearts by His Holy Spirit. And by the way, why is it that when Jesus saw people coming to Him, that He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit when He saw them? It was for the same reason. The Spirit of God brings great joy when we do, when we yield ourselves to Him and do His will. 
So again, that's why we should do this. That's, that's motivation, isn't it? Um, Jesus commands it, but it gives glory to God. It, it adds to Christ's um, people, and it also adds to our reward. But secondly, we should consider this. This is how we give back to God. You know, God has given to us a gift that is infinite, isn't it? It's, it's infinitely precious, something we could never have purchased on our own. We cannot earn our justification, our being accepted by God. That's a free gift. It's not something that we can even maintain. You know, it's something that God maintains. We believe the Bible, what God says in His Word, that He gives it to us and He never takes it from us. It's His free gift through His Son, and we receive it purely by faith, by trusting and relying on Jesus Christ alone. We can't buy it, but we also know that we can't repay Him, right? The debt is, is far too great, but what we can do is show our thankfulness by devoting our lives to Him. I mean, that's the very least that we can do. It'll never repay the debt. It's not meant to. And the reason why Jesus saved us and gave us His Spirit is so that we would give ourselves to Him in this way. It's the only thing we can possibly do that answers to the grace that God has shown to us, that undeserved favor. Now, finally, this is what Jesus did, okay? This is the kind of life Jesus lived. And let me just mention, this is really, when we look at Jesus and we say, you know what? I love him. I, I love who he is. I, I love what he does, right? Well, this is what we love about him, is the fact that he did this very thing. This is the reason why we want to be like him. We want to be like him because he loves his father, and, and he gives us this model of how we are to do this. I mean, how did he love the father? He, he used all of his time to serve him, to worship him, Again, as we were called to do, just, just read Mark's, um, <clears throat> Mark's gospel. Remember how the word immediately is used all the time. It's called the gospel of action because there doesn't seem to be a moment where our Lord Jesus wasn't pressing forward and doing everything his father had called him to do. And you know, we only have a fraction of what that is recorded in the gospel. It's just a fraction because at the end of John's gospel, he tells us that if everything Jesus had said and done was written, that the world itself cannot contain the number of books. Jesus did a lot. He, he gave all of his time to serving the Father. And by the way, he only lived to be, what is it, 33 and a half years of age. And his ministry, what John was referring to, was talking about just the three and a half years in which he was ministering. But he used that time to do his, what his Father called him to do. And to, to be what his father called him to be, his every thought was how he might glorify the one whom he loved. Every word he spoke, everything he did, he did from love for his father. The Bible tells us that he faithfully kept his commandments. And those commandments, the Ten Commandments that people recoil at today, they're meant to be a definition of what love actually is. How we love the father and how we love one another. Jesus did that perfectly. Jesus did only the things that pleased the Father. Jesus devoted himself daily to prayer. Sometimes he sought the Father for entire nights. He served him with all of his soul and with all of his strength. And as far as how he loved mankind, let's, you know, just a couple of things he did. He welcomed everyone who came to him, regardless of their past and what society thought of, of them. Remember the woman with the hemorrhage that said, if I can just reach out and touch the hem of his garment. What was significant about that? The woman had this, had this issue of blood, which means that she was unclean. She was an outcast from society. Touching Jesus technically would make him ceremonial unclean, and nobody wanted this woman to touch them, but Jesus didn't mind. Jesus welcomed this woman. Jesus reached out and touched the ultimate outcast from society. Remember when he touched the leper? I mean, how many of us would do that? Of course, we probably wouldn't do that because we don't have the ability to heal. But Jesus did, and he received him. He could have spoken and healed him with a word, but instead he reached out and gave the man something more, didn't he? Actual human contact, which he had not had for some time. Jesus showed him compassion 
And let's not forget about Mary Magdalene, who at one time was possessed, we, Luke tells us, by seven demons. He welcomed us, okay? We may not have been social outcasts in this sense, but we were outcasts from the kingdom of heaven. We are all spiritual lepers, and He received us and He welcomed us, even though we had committed all these crimes against Him. Jesus also was a servant to His own, his own disciples. He led them, He taught them, He corrected them. He humbled Himself to wash their feet. He protected them from their enemies. He prayed for them to keep them from the evil one. And we need to remember that Jesus does exactly the same thing for us from heaven, he, even more so. He does all these things and more. He is serving us from heaven, keeping us from the evil one and making sure that we go the right way. He gave his life to the Father, and in so doing, he gave himself to us, even suffering on the cross for us. And he did this all out of love. Now, isn't this why we love the Lord Jesus? It should be the reason why we love Him. And we, we love Him for saving us, of course. But we also love Him for who He is. And this is what He is all about. And that's why we really want to be like Him. And that's exactly what Jesus is calling us to do, to give our lives to Him to make the most of every divinely ordained opportunity because let's not forget the situations that Jesus found himself in, those were not accidental and neither is anything that happens to us. Um, the Lord wants us to use these as opportunities in order to serve him and as I said before, we have a new year ahead of us of opportunities. He wants us to be his witnesses in the way we live. He wants us to be His ambassadors in sharing the gospel to others and to be servants, to be His light in the dark world out of love, which is exactly what He was. He wants us to be like Him. So finally, let's just ask this question, how can we be more like Him? If we find, you know, that what we see is attractive and we want to be like Him, how can we become like Him? Well, there's, there's only through the way that God has given to us, and that is through the Word and by His Spirit. Now, God has already given to us His Spirit. If we're trusting on Jesus Christ, relying on Jesus alone to fulfill His promise to save us to all who will trust in Him, we have the Spirit because we can't really do that apart from the Spirit of God. But we also need His Word. Okay, we need the Word to keep the example, the picture, the image, the beauty, the desirability of Christ and His example in front of us, in front of our eyes at all times. We need to let that example by the Spirit move our hearts to draw us to Him and here's one last thing that's very, very important because I, sadly what happens is we, we have these expositions. You know, we, we now have a picture of Jesus in, in front of our, our, the, our mind's eyes, right? When we, we get into the Word of God and we read it and we, we get these pictures, we get these examples, we see something of, of His glory. But what happens is as soon as the book is closed, as soon as the sermon comes to an end, what happens with that that vision that we've seen, that picture of, of those wonderful and beautiful things, it, it's gone. Instantly it's gone. And we don't think about it again until we open the book again or until we're having, you know, listening to another sermon. So here is perhaps the most important thing. We need to hold on to what we see. And we need to keep that in our mind. And we need to let that continually influence our hearts. We need to meditate on these things throughout the day and not forget them, okay? As we're beholding the glory of the Lord, that's what transforms us. But if we don't see it, we're not going to be transformed. So it's not just a glimpse that I get here and here and here throughout the week, but it should be something we're seeing all the time. We should be looking for it. We should be remembering and keeping it before our mind's eye and letting that influence our hearts. And if we do that, that will transform us. It will 
change our character. It will help us in the choices that we make. The decisions we make will be the ones that our Lord Jesus made because Him, He will be in front of us at all times and we'll see what He would do. And we would do that. We would follow that because that's what we want to do. So we're only going to become more like Him to the point that we keep our minds focused and stayed upon Him and keep our hearts warm towards Him. Without those things, we're, we're just... We're going to be spiritually crippled. I really believe this is the key to growing more into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'd all like to believe it's a prayer and a zap from heaven. But that's usually not the way it works. Sometimes it does, but usually it isn't. But instead, it is seeing Christ as he reveals himself in his word and desiring him, loving him, and seeking to become more like him, to apply Christ, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So may the Lord give us grace to do that. Um, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to give us uh, the ability to do this, to remember this, to apply this. And as we do, let's also pray that he would prepare us to receive the table this morning. And let's not forget what the, the communion is. It, it is a communion with Christ, and, and He is present to bless, but it's also meant to remind us or to preach to us the message of His death and His love in giving His life for us. And that's something else He wants us to keep before our minds at all times. So let, let's take just a few moments and pray and ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table.